Hello. Welcome. I'm so glad to see all of you for this wonderful poetry meeting. I know I'm looking forward to it, that's for sure. And uh, my name is Georgia Court. I'm the proprietor here. And uh, I am so glad to be with all of you, particularly one of my very favorite poetry readers is with us today. And I'll give her a fuller introduction in a minute, Miss Linda Albert, and her friend, who I have not heard read her poetry before, but I have read it, and I know it's terrific. So I think <coughs> this is going to be a terrific morning. Uh, but before we get going, I wanted to let you all know about something special that's happening here, poetry-wise, in the middle of March. Many of you, I'm sure, are aware of poetry life that we do every year and have done since 2012, where we bring in actually the world's best poets, poets laureate, National Book Award winners, etc. Excuse me, sir. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, so, um, sorry, I lost sorry. my train of thought. Sorry. Uh, we bring in the world's finest poets to read their work and to interact with audiences. This year, for the first time, not only are we doing that, we're bringing in National Book Award winner Martina Spada but, and uh, Liberian-born poet uh, Patricia Jabba Wesley, but we are also holding <coughs> workshops, high-level workshops with both <coughs> Spada and Wesley. And the ability to be in those workshops is limited to a very few people. We're limiting it to 12 her workshop. It would be two and a half days, uh, uh, March 11th, 12th, 13th, and you would have time learning from the, these poets. You would be creating your own work. You would be meeting one-on-one -on -one with them. At the moment, we are about half subscribed. So if you're interested in taking, being part of these workshops, there's a charge for it. I've forgotten what the exact number, but the information is on the website. If you're interested in attending those, please uh, sign up as soon as you can because the deadline to sign up is February 15th. And one reason is because the teaching poets are asking uh, attendees to send in sample poems, so they're prepared to teach you more fully. So keep that in mind. And that's March 11th through 13th. And there were also <coughs> readings at Florida Studio Theater on Monday the 13th, the afternoon and the evening with those two poets. And uh, I'm not sure if FST's uh, ticket link is active yet. If it's not, it will be within the next couple of days. So you would buy those tickets directly from Florida Studio Theater. Okay, today's readers, I'm going to introduce them uh, as they're about to come up. The first reader is Linda Albert. Linda is an internationally published, award-winning poet, essayist, and former theater director. A communication coach and trainer certified in neurolinguistics and Jungian pattern and dream analysis, she has continued to design workshops, coach, and teach since moving to Florida. <laughs> as well as going on with her writing and appearing at readings. Please welcome Linda Albert. Thank you, Georgia. We are so lucky as poets to have somebody like Georgia Corp. fortunate to have Georgia for this <coughs> um, She is a marvelous poet and the most wonderful supporter of poets. And as my mother uh, warned me, since I have been writing poetry since I was a little girl, it's very hard to make a, make a living as a poet. And, to, and, and poetry is not everybody's favorite not the genre. So thank you all of you for being here. And Today I'm going to read from my book that came out two years ago and very excitingly won an award, an international award in its genre, Charting the Lost Continent, <coughs> Poetry and Other 
discoveries, and it can be ordered through Bookstore One here if you're anybody is interested. Also going to read some new poetry. What matters now? What matters now? The unmade bed I want to straighten, excitement in my chest, creative leaping, the way I'm wed to my computer, the poems spilling over without rest. What matters now? The pages that I long to fill, the shirts I said today I'd iron, the polish chipping on my toes, the need to light a waiting candle, the time I've missed to meditate. What matters now? The poem. <laughs> this is a poem that I don't typically read. I not I don't see myself as a political poet. And yet the times that we're in are so complicated that it seems as though everything has become political, even our most personal experiences. So I feel called to share this not to try to change anybody's mind or open anybody's hearts, but because it's the facts to be shared. Tsunami. She's trying to understand her life, where she fits in to the scheme of things. Whoever made the rules did not have her in mind. A woman, a Jew, the mother of a gay child, not loyal enough, not thin enough, not ordinary enough, not humble enough, not perfect enough. Too spoiled, too smart, too greedy. She thought she was entitled to be happy. She wanted her place in the sun, her piece of the pie. She wanted to fit in. Can you imagine the gall? She lived her life like Hans Brinker, privately, occupied with plugging up the leaks of poison, pain, and imperfection. Not enough hands, fingers sore and weary, the dams of her, the dam of her defenses wearing out, new leaks springing up, water flooding in from everywhere. But then, you know, we move on and we learn from the things that cause us to be challenged or cause us pain. And this poem is called Reflection. It's after W.H. Auden's wonderful poem, Musée des Beaux-Arts. I remember it vividly, how I was taking my nightly bath, lying naked and a little chilly in the tub, not thinking about anything special or pondering a different problem, as Auden knew the old masters understood. Only this time, it was a relief of suffering, a jolt in every cell so great my body leaped. It's a wonder I wasn't electrocuted, found floating face down, bath oil sliding in greasy scales down my lifeless back, just now when knowing could make my life begin. The usual irony, but no, there's also magic in these tales. The mirror I looked in all those years, the mirror, mirror on the wall that kept me snared and found me wanting whose tarnished silver backed a bleak and murky surface rejecting light was nothing but an object. Mirrors don't really talk or have opinions. Amazing that I never noticed. Turns out its voice was in my head. The power was mine to name the seeing. Not a jealous king or queens who kill for my reflection the old masters must have known this human position, how something momentous can happen while someone else is sleeping or having a haircut, 
or Icarus hasn't fallen after all into the sea. <clears throat> Today is the 8th of January, 2023. On the 8th of January, three years ago, my beloved partner passed away. So I felt, although I didn't write this poem, for him specifically, I'm always amazed when my poems seem to have more meaning in the, in the present time than they did with whatever, whatever caused me to be or feel inspired by them. This is a sonnet. It's called, You Came as Swift and Silent as a Fawn. You came as swift and silent as a fawn while I lay unsuspecting through the night and then I woke, as startled as the dawn, to find the world I'd known had turned to white. It was as if you'd raised a healing hand and mended nature's wounds and scars so well that in some way I could not understand. I too was caught within your healing spell. I wonder if I felt a warning chill in time to light the fire and lock the doors. Would I be safe inside and sleeping still or would I run out barefoot to be yours? If I had known you'd come but not to stay, could I have shut my eyes and turned away? Mm -hmm. But you know, the years pass, and memories last, and the pain, the sharpest pain of grieving, finally can succeed. Symptoms die down a bit, and this is how what wind can do. An artist wind picked up the moss, usually positioned like drapery on the oak trees in the park next door, and rearranged it into creatures lying scattered in profusion on the grass. An Aussie doodle, legs outstretched, prehensiled tail in halted herding. A black-winged osprey beak fresh-fished to feed his waiting nestlings. Frogs and squirrels mid-hop and scurry, all frozen in enchanted slumber. I've never viewed that scene before. The trees always looking more serene, as though they belonged on the grounds of a southern antebellum mansion. Now underdressed and not accustomed to such exotic phenomena. I should have taken pictures. Later, at home, I remember that time, 60 years ago, enwrapped in a small classroom at the University of Michigan as Professor Eastman demonstrated how the best poems always have more than one meaning. It was as though we were working with a 14-line sonnet of Wordsworth's. Possibly, it is a beauteous evening, calm and free. It was as though Mr. Wordsworth born 1770, died 1850, was at the desk beside me. The awe I felt that so few words could say so much. I wanted to be that kind of poet. If you had been with me that day and also seen that wind-carved moss, might we have looked up like children and lovers sometimes do with clouds to play a game of finding different meanings together. Or maybe now you left and joined the wind and star, stars yourself, my love. It was you who helped to redesign the park that day to demonstrate that we could share amusement still as death-defying poets dare we do. 
that was a new poem, not in my book. And this one also, with this, is not in my book. It was inspired by the fact that I now live in a wonderful retirement community. Many of my friends are here, and some of them actually have, well, many of us, <laughs> I think, are exploring through the same experiences. Those of you who are young have something to look forward to. <laughs> and uh, I've gone back to my roots and, 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 and making lighter of it, writing light verse, because some, some things are really worth being amused by. Doctor appointments. <laughs> like rabbits they mate. They proliferate. One becomes two. Two becomes four. One follows through. One is before. For some, you must fast and hope you will last. Your belly might grumble. The gowns make you humble. You set your alarm, fill out forms long as your arm. There are co-pays and x-rays, PAs and practitioners. You now must be seen by a team of commissioners. <laughs> Here's a new order request. Time again for a test. How could, it, how could two years have passed since you had that one last? It's eyes, ears, and hearts, bones, lungs, or bladder. Is everything good, or has something turned badder? <laughs> your blood work is wanted, but not by the feds. It could be your age. It might be your meds. Your teeth need more flossing. Extra tweaks for your gums. Implants and crowns involve five-figure sums. Who knew that retirement was nothing to fear since going to doctors could become a career? <laughs> is this an anomaly, or have you decided your doctors mean well, but the plan is misguided? I have a friend who thinks healthcare is hollow. It could be her example is worthwhile to follow. She only eats fried foods and red meat and candy. Her outlook is sunny. Her digestion is dandy. A banana a day, and she's ready for action. She doesn't take meds, so no adverse reactions. Without those appointments, her calendar is clear. She's always free for fun to appear. But AMA isn't likely to buy it. But whatever her secret, I'm tempted to try it. <laughs> <laughs> what remains? It takes so long to peel skin from your orange self. You could be dried up dead before you dare disorder, laugh yourself sticky, drink the sky, become cerulean blue. Better do it now. Devour the peach before it shrivels. Let juice and bits of yellow pulp define you. Snail along your tongue. Create tributaries down your chin. Then beach like tiny landing crafts in the soft crevices of your neck. Find compassion for critics, the ones who leave and those alive in you who fear such messy appetites. Wear a bright orange fool's cap on your head to keep the heat from leaving when you have to cry. Its tasseled bells remind there is no need to find false skins for cover. The unpeeled flesh is where your juice remains. One more. Talking myself down. You know that time at the circus when the aerialist climbed to the tenth top? The audience stills. A boy swings upside down and backwards, arms upstretched biceps bulging, poised to catch a girl who flies. And a girl in spangled leotard and tights, posed on a tiny platform high above us, catapults herself 
in sores, that time when she suspends in air, that stunning time when no one breathes between. I wonder when I reach my own finale, when flesh and spirit must take separate vows, will the daring hurl toward new adventures, trusting in that time between, while I lie dizzied on a bed, just feet above the ground, clutching any hand who will have me, afraid to go where I have never been. I want to leave with better grace than all my hanging onto earth suggests. I practice when I can on airplanes, when turbulence and seatbelt signs become my own trapeze. I think about the ones I love, count savings still unused, the benefit of my untimely death, picture well-attended funerals, console myself by feeling missed. I will my muscles to relax, unclench the death grip on my seat arms, imagine calmly flying free like spangled girls in leotards who dare to love the time between. Wonderful. Thank you so much for that reading. Uh, we're going to have our second reader now, but when both are finished, uh, we're going to open it up to the audience. So you'll be able, all those things you're thinking you'd like to say right now to them, you can say them in a few minutes. So hang on to the thought. Our next uh, reader is Judy Benfari. She grew up in Greensboro, North Carolina, and studied at Sullins College, now defunct. What happened to it? My gosh in Bristol, Virginia for one year. She then returned to Greensboro for two years to attend the University of North Carolina, Greensboro, where she stuttered, studied under poets Randall Jarrell and Fred Chappelle for a semester. With a free spirit and deep desire to make her way to Boston, Judy left college and caught a bus to Boston on a whim. She lived in a single room, third floor, walk-up apartment on Beacon Street for several, ye several years and eventually moved to Cambridge where she met her husband, Bob. Please welcome Judy Benfari for her inaugural time at this podium. something first. Um, I lived mostly in the South, um, in North Carolina, Durham, North Carolina, and uh, never wrote poetry. And uh, for many years, uh, we moved, moved between uh, Durham and Greensboro, North Carolina. But the first part of it, it was Durham, and that was way out in the country. And that's where I started my first five to seven years um, before we moved to Greensboro. I just thought I should tell you that because going from Durham countryside and the Eno River and over to Greensboro was quite a different pace. So uh, I'm going to start with Lion in the Tree. <laughs> What could she witness so long ago, 
came to her now, as if she could remember how the prickly fragments of her petulance created icy shards of silence. Stood the test of time while she and her lion ignored the scolding as incorrectly assessed. Sitting stoically in her small rattan chair, face to the wall, she knows she can outlast all exile, given her propensity for never giving in. She stares at the green ivy wallpaper while dinner is served. She will sit there until the cows come home, even after the lights are off, and she is alone in the dark to spend hours served for willful disobedience. In her smocked blue frock with a fancy sash, fashioned in a perfect bow, and with a flourish, she slides her feet out of her black patent leather shoes and quietly slips off her socks. She sits alone in the stoic silence in her chair, pretending, wandering, testing her stamina as she twists into a tiny knot. She is sleepy. He is there, her secret friend, the lion who protects her. His lion spirit dangles from an old desert tree. So tired, fatigued by Serengeti treks, as he tumbles off balance down into her dream. The next uh, poem is called Nana. Okay. Nana. Nana was my great grandmother from Lansing, Michigan. And she used to come visit us in the summertime in Durham. There were always chores. Red clay dust settled everywhere. Strenuous, suffocating moments sacrificed for chores with help on 40 acres of land. Fans worrying. Nana, our great grandmother, nearly tucked her linen hanky inside her dress sleeve. Her swollen feet and heavy gray stockings squished into heavy black shoes. She snuggled up in the white wooden lawn chairs on our red brick patio under an oak tree in late afternoon, sipping an icy cool gin and tonic with a slice of wine. Nana's handheld decorative paper fan cools her face. With her engraved white hanky, she pats away the sweat. Bless her heart, she aims to stay cool, as cool as we can get, out on dirt, clay red, rusty, cold mill road. There were stories to tell, a stack of memories, pigs breaking out of the pig pen, pigs on the loose on an early Sunday morning. Mom driving crated chickens to market in a dented, rusty, banged up truck. Feathers flying everywhere on a steamy, scorchy, red hot, heated day. Red day dust funnels swirling off Cold Mill Road, settling down softly on floating, swirling chicken feathers. A loose cow now and then from Boutwell's pasture Raccoon hunters running dogs late into the night. For Nana, we were her circus, which gave our hearts her heartfelt delight. As for me, the indelible memories of a strange childhood, along with the suffocating and intolerable weight of sweat and duty. This next poem is called Horse. I like the flow of poetry. Its random pace is effortless, dropping the reins of words softly on my horse's neck, going where the words want to go. Off the path, perhaps a dead stop or a sudden jump away from a landed chipmunk, 
perhaps a slow turtle with ideas startled by the hoofs, click clacking over loose rocks, working their way steadily with my body on the horse's back, my boots set snug in stirrups. My knees and legs push us on with the reins and the horse on the bit, my hands to guide, to halt, to trot, then a quiet walk through a forest trail. I let the stirrups rhythm swing with the, with the horse's pace, his, his head, his mane, eyes flickering. We share a common communion, the path, the clip-clop of hoofs, a sudden move when surprised by swaying shadows that cross his watching eyes. I treasure the silence of us, the time we share, and the poems we write together. My next, my next poem is called Fate in Free Fall. I could be a verb or a commonplace now. I might wish upon a star and ask for more than just a noun or verb. But curse words sleep at night. That's my current insight. I'm in a swirling eddy, circulating inner brain trauma, and gesticulating pages of rhyme into thin air. There goes the banishment bell. I'm off to finger fine white paper to capture the apostrophe in the contraction and seize the S. As to what's missing, a play, a performer, a writer, yards of lost interest wandering down worn paths, all the while kicking rocks, waiting for an idea, an inkling, a nod, fetching, itching for what's growing inside. So up with the blinds, lean into the breeze, and catch a breath of cool air. If I had my druthers, I would collect words I do not use. I would shake everything out of my head and let it all fall where fate will claim its destiny. My next poem is called cooped up during COVID. Paper snow piles up across my desk. My Rolodex is overgrown, never purged. The shredded paper notes of things to do, the puzzling one-line nuggets, an errant note for poison sauce. All fragmented thoughts chime and dangle as I leave my screen and turn to view the small wet crescent sandy beach. There is a woman on the beach, her faithful friend untethered, a large black dog eager for another toss, then jumping in and swimming out to fetch, swimming back to drop the ball before her sand encrusted feet. The woman heaves the tennis ball far out across the water. The black dog jumps in Paws paddling fast and hard. Head up to tech, to fetch and restore. Over, I mean, sorry, and retrieve. Over and over and over. This is today's gift my, from my condo view. A woman and her dog together. Their solid connection, love and trust with a final toss to fetch the two to part together. <clears throat> um, this is a sort of a long poem, but it's called Who Stole My Zeal? A Daydream. I reckon I've suffered a loss wasn't worth a copper penny anyway. 
My vigor is packed on my back. I'm ready to go. My indolence hitches up with sloth. The two of us hang upside down. We polish my nails and his claws in bright Revlon red with white polka dots. But let me tell you, from this hanging chad of a swing, on my porch, I'm all set for here, forever, until the rusty chain lets go. I sip a tepid, tasteless, energy boost drink, a fruity pomegranate juice, which transforms itself on the way down into a medicinal saffron mouthwash that tastes no better than household cleaner. Where do all these cheap tin mini cans go to die? So easily polarized, then sent on down to Hades. Fractured pieces and parts fluttering down through the tunnels of earth, tin dumped so deep the weight will cause the earth to belch. Well, that's enough for daydreams, time for chores or safe distancing stores, time to rustle up zeal after my rest. But oh dear, now my recipes are at rest, but all the ingredients are on the loose. is called Hidden in the Crevices. She randomly paces her folded poems in the crevices of stacked rocks to surprise the inquisitive. Her words may rhyme. Other words may possess an attitude. The multicolored rainbow kite tails bump along the path behind her. She lifts the kite and lets it flutter in the wind, holding tight. She flings it high to catch the swirling gusts, releases stream towards sky, up into the strong cool air. She is ecstatic with the pull and thrill to play the kite, yet to control, to control the kite, to hold on forever. Why not be swept away out to sea with kite in hand, tossing, turning, dancing over salt fringe waves beneath, until time to leave, to fly away, to settle back into her youth, the gaiety, the frolic. Memory saves her hours, receives the windy gusts, and folds her journey into folded paper, a smut fit, safe, and in her pockets to set her words in place within the hidden crevices. And the last poem that I'm going to read is called Poetical Fret. I am transmitted by levity to the ladder in my office as I climb its three steps to view the landscape of dismay spread across the floor. I am a paper hoarder. There are piles to go to find a trail through all the paper crushed and crinkled, discarded notes, unopened mail, and bills, magazines to stack, unread. If you like to write, avoid white paper. Use lined paper to steady words. Do not aim to pen the perfect poem, for all the perfect words will change their shape. Reworked, axed, chopped up, dumped out, Poetry is a paper mill production. Better yet, a simple conversation within a single poet's soul who takes her pen and writes it like it really is. Thank you for your attention.
Uh, that's a question for both of you, maybe one at a time. You, you read a poem that was inspired by Auden, and I'm just wondering who you're reading now, if there's any any particular poet or poetry that you either of you are reading right now. I, I very much love Ellen Bass, among other poets. She's really one of my very favorites, and I've recently studied with her, and I, I'm a, I was lucky to have her um, comment on the poem um, about uh, what the wind can do, which I think helped me make it stronger. So. Um, I, I like a lot of poets. I like a lot. Of, I can always like Emily Dickinson. I like a lot of the, a lot of the the old poets, but um, I keep up with the new ones too. Thank you for the question. Yeah. Anybody have any questions for me? No, what uh, how about who? Oh, who yeah, who are you okay. reading? Yeah. Um, well, I studied under Randall Jarrell, and um, oh God. Um, uh, oh, French, Chappell. French, Fred Chapel. I'm sorry, um, at the University of North Carolina. And both of them were wonderful. I had a semester with each one, and it was very interesting. Um, it was unfortunate that right after that semester, Randall Jarrell lost his life in a uh, car wreck in Chapel Hill. And um, so that was the end of Randall. And Randall was a good friend of our family. He and his wife lived out in Guilford College behind us, and we did get to see them, and we went to the same church. So we were quite, uh, you know, friendly with them. Um, so that's that. What else should I say? <laughs> no, I, I also <laughs> always love Billy Collins, by the way. Yes. Um, this is fading memory, but many years ago, I read a book called Poets in Their Youth. Do you know that book? Because Gerald is in it, but I believe that it was all Southern, so-called regional writers. Probably not. Yeah. yeah. Yes, and I don't, I don't know the book you're talking about, but I, maybe I'll sort of research it and see. No, if well, I have it at SBC, I oh, think. Oh, good. So. Okay, great. Thank you. That's good. Question over there. When do you write? Where do you write? How often? How often do you write? What is your um, go to? What is your go to? Go to. Where does your go to? Okay. I happen to be one of those writers that um, sits at her desk for a while and looks out the window and contemplates what she's going to write for the day. Because I do write quite frequently. Um, Sometimes I just go with the flow and whatever I want to do, but it's how I do work through my poems. And um, I tend to really enjoy poetry. It's something that you can do, anybody can do, and I think that it's very valuable uh, time for people to spend trying to put those words together just a little bit and think about what they've written because I think that once you find out what you've written, it becomes pretty apparent to you that you can write, anybody can write, and anybody can write well. So if anybody is looking to learn how to write, just pick your pen up and start writing. Um, I would like to say that I've had a real routine, like. My friend Joanna uh, McClellan Glass, who was sitting in my audience and is a wonderful playwright, and is working on a play right now. And I, when I when I was younger, I I, um, I snatched every bit of time that I could when my young children were napping, when they were at school, and I also thought I was a night person, as a, and I'm still a night person, really. I um, I'm a I I am very much intrigued by metaphor. And, and rhythm, and, and, and if I have something that I feel called to say, and I discover 
the proper metaphor, the objective correlative that's really going to tell the story, then I can work on it for hours and hours and stay way up into the night. And also, some of these poems that come are here in my collection were written earlier and then reworked and reworked and reworked. One of um, the gifts that, that Auden gave to poets was that he wrote letters to young poets. <clears throat> and he said that for him, because poetry is spare compared to um, prose, every word he felt had to be set like a gem. And I'm a big word person, so I spent a lot of time at the dictionary. And I can write, write a poem, and I was just, in, in fact, going over the poems I would read today and thinking, I think I could make this poem better now. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm always, in a sense, working on my poetry. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. Other, other questions? What inspires you? You know, recently, um, I've been thinking about that subject. Given all the trials and tribulations we're experiencing throughout the world that we're not used to, especially if we were young and growing up in another world, things are very strange for us older people because this is not supposed to be happening. So basically, I'm worried, and I, I have to confess that um, I find it very distracting, the talking heads, the TV, and all that. So I've become more a reader and a listener and searching what there is outside in the beauty of this world. My inspiration, I think, um, when, I, when I was always writing, and I, I was the sort of the family the invitation writer, and I could, I could always, I could feel rhythm. I couldn't sing, but I could feel rhythm. I could rhyme. And when I was young, light verse was very popular. It was being published in the national magazines, and I was, I didn't realize how lucky I was, but I was published in the call from the Wall Street Journal and places like that where they paid by the line. I, my first poem. I earned ten dollars, five dollars a month. They bought my shortest poem, but um, I really, you know, I've taken a lot of writing classes because I always wanted to improve my light verse. And out of that, fortunately for me, and good teaching, grew um, a recognition that I could also write poetry. And I think for me, it was a, a way for me to express who I am in sort of secret. In, in ways that I could write it when it didn't seem to be possible to say it in sense out loud, so I was hiding behind metaphors. And when I had my book, writing, um, Charting the Lost Continent, I suddenly felt this great anxiety. I thought, oh my God, I put this out here and everybody's gonna think I'm crazy. <laughs> I developed such a good persona. So I, I was worried sort of that I really only wrote about myself and that I was pretty self-absorbed. But my hope was, and it still is, that through my own life experience, I'm hopefully writing what is also universal. And that's how I know the world. Yeah. Thank you. And by the way, she mentioned her book. And I think we're out of it right now, but you can order it through us. So. But thank you all for coming. We really appreciate it. to move to Boston, she threw away all her poetry, which is a shame. She decided that she wasn't any good as a poet. And then she lived her whole life, adult life, in Boston, and, and it wasn't until for years later until she came to Sarasota Bay 